Today we're going to talk about architectural diagrams and then we'll move into some other advanced techniques in Illustrator including live paints and brushes and those kinds of things. Uh, so we'll go through that. I think um, diagramming is something that's absolutely critical that you learn to do. And uh, this one is going to be, this particular lecture is going to be geared toward the architecture students because it's something you guys have to do all the time. Um, that being said, I don't think it's something that those of you that are in industrial design can just dismiss and say, oh, it's not important. The concepts are the same. You still have to be able to get ideas out quickly and understand what the major components of something are uh, when you're doing your design. So I apologize for those of you in industrial design because this is focused on the architecture side, though recognizing my backgrounds in architecture, it makes sense for me to give this lecture around architecture rather than industrial design. So what fundamentally is a diagram in the first place? A diagram is your major idea. It's the big thing that you want to come across. I think it, the easiest way of explaining it is it's kind of like a one-liner joke where there's, there's just, there it is. Boom. This is everything I have to do. And so you're trying to distill down that major idea into a really simple way to understand. So you come up with this great idea. How do you explain that simply and easily through the form of a diagram? It should be clear and it should be easy to understand. And that's the big thing. I think all too often when people are doing diagrams, they make it too complicated. It really is about that fundamental big idea. So how do you learn to diagram in the first place? Well, it takes a lot of practice. And a sketchbook is a great place to practice. So most of you don't carry sketchbooks anymore. I know that's like the, the antiquated, I'm old, so I, I say you should carry a sketchbook. But the truth is, that's a lot of how you get your ideas out. Computers just aren't fast enough. I mean, I guess some of us on iPads with, with the pencils and whatever, you could, you could sketch out your ideas fast enough. But if your medium causes you to slow down and bog down, then you're not getting the idea across fast enough. And you're not being able to, if you can't um, represent what you're thinking fast enough, you'll get caught up in just thinking about it as opposed to actually putting it on paper. And so when you get to the point in whatever medium it is that you can actually diagram and design while you're working with it, that's a good place to be. And so if you're fast enough on the computer, sure, you could do it that way. But I guarantee all of you are fast enough with a pencil and a piece of paper because there's no barrier to getting your ideas out there. So when you're trying to figure out your, your, your sketches, your diagrams, what, what can you do to kind of enhance that? I think the biggest thing is if you change your medium, you'll suddenly start to, to adapt into diagramming. So if, for example, you always draw in a, uh, you know, Sharpie or whatever, whatever your choice of pen is, and suddenly you pick up a pencil, you're inclined to do something a little bit different. You're inclined to diagram with it, especially if that pencil was red or blue or green or pink. I don't care what color it was. But if you pick up something different, it's different so you're showing an idea. And typically that's the big barium. So try adding color, try cutting things out, and pasting them in. Those are good strategies. Different medium, pencil, charcoal, pastel, watercolor. I don't know how you could watercolor in a sketchbook, so I should probably remove that because your sketchbook could get soggy. But you get the idea. So this was a sketchbook that I had in grad school. It was before I graduated. I'll show you my next uh, sketchbook that I started using. But I think this is a pretty good uh, page. This was my first semester um, in grad school. This was my sketchbook. And I think the important thing to point out here is that every single drawing on this particular set of pages was not drawn in my sketchbook. It was on some other piece of paper. But what did I do? I cut it out and I taped it in. It was a way of collecting those ideas. And these were all about the big ideas. I moved on and I started carrying these. These are smaller. It's made by Moleskin. I think they still make it. It's called a Japanese Fold Sketchbook. And it's pretty cool because the pages are continuous. So you, you, everything's folded as opposed to actually turning the page and committing to that turn of the page. You just kind of keep drawing. Uh, and it's kind of a nice way. You see that everything just kind of keeps flowing. Uh, so it worked really nicely for me uh, in terms of sketching. So you have to find what it is that works for you. So let's look at some diagram types and some examples of those types. So these are the types that I'm going to go over today. Figure ground, highlighting arrows and flow lines, components, text and typography, and movement. Now I should point out that diagrams often 
bridge the gaps between these. So something that is an arrow and flow line also tends to show movement, so they kind of overlap a little bit. Likewise, you're going to see a lot of figure ground and highlighting blended together. So I tried to distill these out into major ideas so that you understand, hey, this is one big way of representing something. This is another big way of representing something. But recognize that they always crossbreed. You're always going to get some la overlap as I go through. And you'll quickly see that as we start to go through these various ideas. So we'll start with the figure ground technique. And the idea behind figure ground is it's fundamentally about a strong contrast that's in your design. Something that's solid, something that's not. Something that's public, something that's private. So it's a big contrast. And we're going to show that through a solid and void type diagram. So I'll, I'll throw it way back to 1748. This is Gian Battista Noli's plan of Rome. He did this plan of Rome drew the plan of Rome. It's not really a plan. It's actually a diagram. Anybody seen this one before? Nobody's seen it before? Wow. Okay. Anybody been to Rome before? Awesome city. So that should be on your bucket list. Go to Rome. It's great. Okay. So what is he actually showing us? It's not really a plan of Rome. We don't see the buildings. We see a little bit of the buildings, but not really. So what are we seeing here? What's white? The streets. the streets. The streets are white. What else is white? Plazas. What else is white? How about the inside of churches? That's white, too. Interesting. What's black? Houses, stores, right? What? Darkness. Darkness. No, not quite. So what he's actually showing us, this is a diagram of Rome that's showing us what is public and what is private. Where can I go and where can I not go? And so we see the whole of Rome in that context. And because the streets are public, it ends up looking like a map or a plan of Rome. But we're also seeing the insides of churches. Those are public. You can walk right into any one of those. So anything that's public is going to be open like that, and it's going to be white. If we zoomed in on the Pantheon, for example, we could see the Pantheon there. You could see that you could go right inside it. You can go to all the little niches and everything. But the surrounding structure, the buildings around it, are all shaded in because you can't access those. Those aren't public. So the same strategy applies today. So that's a long time ago that he had that diagram of Rome. But we use the same thing all the time. So here's an example from a museum. The white spaces are the places you can go to. The blue spaces are the places you can't. And we inherently understand that when we see these types of diagrams. So this is a, a Rem Coolhouse, one of his projects from way back. I don't think it was ever built. It was a hypothetical project, I believe. This was a library competition. And he was taking this building, and he was carving out voids from inside of the building. So he used the same diagrammatic strategy when he started to, to show what was happening in the building. So these, unlike the plan view, these are in section. But the idea here was that there was a, a part of the building that housed the library itself, the stacks, the books. And those were dense, and they were shown in black. And then there was these voids that were carved out of those stacks, of that solid mass, that were the places where you go to read, where there's more air. And so those are shown. So we have the solid, which is the stacks, and the open areas, which are shown in white. So he's using the same strategy here to denote a strong contrast, the dense books versus the open space where we can do our reading. Here's a bunch of the plans. Same diagrammatic strategy, section, and then flip to plan. Same solid and void setup. This is out of a book called The Endless City. Kind of the same idea here. Uh, and again, this kind of bridges into color coding. So we can, we can do a little bit of a hybrid here. But they've broken down components of cities. Uh, and then they do some fun stuff where they reorganize the cities based on all the little blocks, which is kind of fun to see. It's just a different way of looking at it. So we'll move on to the next diagrammatic technique. This one is called highlighting. And the, the key here is that we're highlighting something that's different within the design framework. 
we're accenting something specific. We're trying to draw your attention into something. Look at this. Don't look at the other stuff. Look at this. It can be done in model as well as doing it in drawing. So we're talking a lot about drawing, but it doesn't mean you couldn't have a diagrammatic model. Sometimes modeling is a really effective way of getting ideas across. Um, sometimes people just add color, and it's essentially color coding. This is this. Draw your attention to this particular thing. So here we have an example with the old building in yellow. New building is in white, but we've got three different floors. There is something happening on those upper two floors. They're in red. They draw my attention. I don't know what this building is. I don't know what's shown there, but I can tell that that's important just because of the diagram. Another example here of a building with different pieces within the building. And so we see the same drawing, same kind of axonometric 3D drawing, and then certain pieces of the building are highlighted, and they're telling us, oh, these yellow areas are amenities. The orange areas are business support areas. So we, in the portfolio lecture, I showed you a bunch of examples from Alex Holgraf, his visualizing architecture. Here's a, some more examples of his that I think help to kind of illustrate the idea behind a diagram. So in this particular example, he split his building so that there's this, this um, natural cavity between the two buildings. And he's showing us that that ties to two different things on the horizon, one of which is the grain elevator, the other one is the water tower. And then he's given us the plan view with the circle and the arrow. And then he's showing us the same thing in our section view with the same color arrow tying the two together. So we see that this view is about the grain towers. This view is about the water, um, water tower. Same kind of color fabric here. He's highlighting the views from this building in these kind of blue gradient swatches. And so each one of those relates to, in plan view, down here to the perspective view. So in this particular example right here, let's see if we can draw on it. There we go. We see the view coming out this way. That represents this view down here looking that direction. Same thing where we've got the view there is looking right here off in that direction. So there's a correlation between the plan and the section view. This was a, a student project showing kind of basic conceptual plan of a particular building. I think this one is a great example of color coding. It's also a great example of a unicorn throwing up all over a particular drawing. There's too much color. So in this particular example, they decided to color code everything. So we have the full spectrum of the rainbow. And so you don't really get drawn to something specific. You get overwhelmed by that. You could simplify this and say, oh, I want to I wanna talk about the theater. Strip away all the color and just have the theater highlighted. Then do another little drawing. Strip away all the color and show the civic plaza underneath. But somehow when you combine it together, it's just too much. It's too overpowering. But it is a very good example of color coding or highlighting particular regions. So know when to edit and when to simplify. And in this case, I think some simplification would be good. Sorry to whoever actually did that one. So here, we've got a plan. We've got red areas, and we've got blue areas. I'm not sure I could tell you. I could speculate on what a red area would be and what a blue area would be. But I know there's a contrast between them. I know I'm supposed to look at one versus the other. Another example here using the same colors. This one, I know a little bit more about it. Uh, it was a project done on a river. The blue, obviously, is representative of the river. The red is the city behind. So there's a, the, this building is inhabiting the zone between the natural and the urban. And so this diagram was about that and showing that, recognizing that the bustle in the urban was sh chosen to be red. We talked about color theory last class. Another example here, we're using the same axonometric and then highlighting certain specific pieces of it. We've got the terraces shown there. As I move forward by a slide, here again we have a bunch of different components of the building. So if I had done this all together, and I think the next page might have one where they're all together like this, this ends up being too much. It's the same kind of thing. Too much color on one. It's much clearer when you separate it out and say, 
This is the offices. This is the housing. This is the hotel and restaurant block. So just by separating it out, you wouldn't even have to use different colors on all of these blocks. As opposed to this, where they end up being all muddled together. A few more of Alex Holgress. I like to show his examples because I hope they inspire you to do higher quality work. You can just tell that graphically they're just really nice. Um, same concept here. We're drawn to what's happening in the red because that color stands out versus the other colors. So it's an important way of kind of highlighting a specific feature of this particular model or drawing. Arrows, flow lines. So these are fundamentally about showing movement or showing um, views, something specific that's happening that you want to point out. So I'm going to, well, let me talk about this one, for example, first. So this one right here, as we look at it, I think this is a great, really subtle way. There's not big arrowheads or anything on it, but if we look at the red line right there, this is about how people move up into a stadium or a theater. So we start with the big, thick red line, and as we move, you see that a little tiny bit of it branches off and goes down. But the bulk of that thick line continues up. Then at the next junction right here, a little bit comes down, and a thinner line continues up. So just by varying the width of the line, we can see how many people are entering and where those people are getting off, so to speak. So it's a subtle way of diagramming what's happening as people move through this particular building. So I'm going to present a challenge to you. So flip your page over. Most of you have pencils out. If I came to you and I said, I have a house, and this particular house is called the floating roof house, how would you diagram a floating roof house? I'll give you like 30 seconds. Remember, it's quick. That's good. You guys are all getting the idea. Okay, I'm seeing lots of like this. Oops. Oh, come on. Really? Yeah, reconnecting. Yeah, I know. It's like this is the one slide I need this for. Yeah, desktop issue. Yeah, I know. I can tell. It's killing me. All right, well, so much for that, right? The point was that most of you had the idea of a floating roof house. So let's look at what Takaharo's drawing and diagram actually was for this particular house. Same concept as what you were talking about. So we got a little more context. We've got the whole... Um, side, the kind of a section of the hillside, and we have the, the roof there, and we've got one simple arrow that goes through it. The idea that the hillside flows through this particular house. Now this is actually a real project. This is one of the more technical drawings of it. It's beautiful uh, sectional perspective here, looking through that building. The idea that the roof floats and the hillside can flow through the house. Let's look at it in practice. There obviously, there has to be some structure. You can't levitate the roof. But at the same time, this feels very much like the hillside flows right through the house. And that was their major design concept. Another view of it. I don't want to know how much those sliding doors cost. So another example here, where we've got these little view pods that are in red. And then we've got lines coming out from those pods. Showing there's a connection, there's a view, there's something happening out there. And so it's a simple uh, flow line telling us that particular piece of information. 
In this particular example, we have the red lines that run diagonal across um, the drawing here. They're connecting certain things across a particular plaza. I'm not sure what they are, but we get the idea behind it. This particular project was about a raised stage that was looking out over the crowds, so to speak. And so we're showing that stage as the central location with the arrows uh, fanning out from it. I think the arrows are a little bit heavy-handed in this particular diagram, but that's a personal preference. So this is, a, this is again, about um, showing something that's happening in the particular building. In this case, it had to do with heat and cooling this particular building. Um, and so we're showing air flowing through the building. I have slight issues with this drawing. Uh, technically speaking, the air should come here and should curl up and go out that way because of the stack cooling effect, air, warm air rises. So unless you had a really strong wind that was blowing through the building in that context, you wouldn't get the arrows looking like that. They'd curl up instead. So it's just a little bit different, but the concept is still here, and they're showing that. Components. So this is where we try to isolate certain building components. We break it apart. Sometimes it's called the exploded axonometric. The idea that we're pulling maybe the facade off and the roof up and we're seeing what's happening inside. We can use that to our advantage in this same context. So here's an example. Uh, I think it's a beautiful rendering to begin with, but it is fundamentally a diagram. It's not the building itself because that whole superstructure, the skin of the building, isn't floating up there. But they've gone in and they've lifted that up, they've pulled it up to show what's underneath. And so by doing that, we're diagramming what's happening. This is one piece of the building, and we're lifting it off. And so it can be done in model form. It can be done in drawing form, uh, et cetera. These ones have to do with structure, building structure, building skin. Anybody seen the Sendai Media Tech before? The building? A few of you are aware of it. That's good. Uh, so this is Toyo Ito's diagram of the Sendai Media Tech. So I can't read. Japanese, so I have no idea what any of this says. Maybe some of you do, but I don't. But I can tell by looking at this that this building has something to do with floor plates and these kind of twisting structures that come up through the floor just by this particular diagram. He also did a series of the solid void, the Noli Plan of Rome style, the figure ground, uh, these are all the plans, diagrams, showing where the media is stored versus where are the public spaces. So same concept. So remember, we're bridging gaps. We're showing lots of different um, ways of diagramming something. Here's another simplified diagram of this particular building. We've got the floor plates. We've got a skin that's applied on the front. And we've got some kind of tubes that go through the building itself. A little bit more technical information here about the deformation and the kind of more of the structure of how these tubes work. And then we get to what's happening in the building itself, the actual built building. So all of these tubes that puncture through all the floors provide the building services. So we have elevators, we have stairwells, we have water pipes, sprinkler pipes. All of those services are going through these wells that puncture through each floor. They also serve as the primary structure for the building. They're what hold up plate, floor, floor plate to floor plate. So we can see in this example here, right, we have this, the exit stairs that are going up. In this example here, we've got the elevator shaft that goes up. In this example here, you can see some of the building's plumbing going right up through there. So they are provide the service for this particular building. And as we look at it at night, we see the strong floor plates with these twisting structures going through them. Let me back up for one second. I want to point out one other thing. This has nothing to do with digital tools, but I find it so fun that I have to talk about it. Um, I did used to teach the construction class, so I love this kind of stuff and materials. So this is your fire stair. So let's say you're up on the third or fourth floor of this building and there's a big fire on the second floor. You have to be able to get into that fire stair from your floor. You have to be able to go down past the fire. Now let's assume that there's that raging fire on the second floor and you have to go down past that fire. Would you be a little nervous in a glass tube to go past the floor with all the fire on it? No. Really? I would be. So 
we have to solve a couple things. One, that glass needs to be some kind of a fire rated glass so that you can actually not burn yourself or that the glass wouldn't melt in that raging fire. So you have to solve that problem. But you also have to solve the problem of there's a glass wall between me and the raging fire. Am I going to be OK? Can I actually physically get down through this? So there's a two part problem. So this is where material science becomes a really interesting factor in the world of design. So Toyo Ito went to his engineers and he said, OK, we have to figure out this problem. How are we going to solve this? So the first thing is, this glass is special glass. It's not traditional fire glass. Traditional fire glass has a wire mesh that's molded inside. You see this sometimes in like doors that have windows cut in them. You see that little grid pattern. That's traditional fire glass. It adds the str strength to the, to the window so that you can have a fire on the other side. Uh, in this case, they didn't want the, the mesh. It's ugly. They wanted to keep it clean. So this is actually a sandwich of glass. There's a glass layer on the outside, and then there's a special gel. It's called an intumescent gel that's on the inside of the glass, and then there's another piece of glass. And so this intumescent gel is a fire-resistant, heat-resistant gel that's clear that could allow you, as you're walking down past that fire, to walk over and put your hand on the glass and not burn. It's a really cool product. Furthermore, the makers of that have a choice. When it's exposed to heat, it can remain transparent or it can turn opaque. And so in this case, they chose to make it turn opaque. So not only can you touch the glass, but it also solves the visual problem of seeing the raging fire outside. Really cool use of technology to solve a problem. That had nothing to do with architectural diagrams, but I had to talk about it because it's so cool. So if you're interested in that product, uh, you can actually do a Google search or a YouTube search for intumescent paint. They make the same stuff in a paint, and you could like paint it on a piece of plywood, and the piece of plywood wouldn't burn when it's exposed to flame. It's a really cool product. Anyway, side note, not relevant, but I had to talk about it. So another example here, we've got the building itself pulled apart various pieces of it. You've got the core tower, you've got the, the front set, uh, or whatever the skin is, and all those pieces are pulled apart. This one, we've got kind of the, the skin of the building, but we can see whatever these jewels are that are inside. And we're emphasizing those because of the color. A diagrid, structural diagrid. Heating and cooling effect. Pantheon. Anybody, one of you had been to Rome before. Did you go to the Pantheon? Awesome building, right? So this is another one of your bucket list things. It's like when I tell you you have to go to Machu Picchu. Um, same kind of thing. You have to go to Rome and just do me a favor. Just go sit there for a while. Like you just need to kind of soak this in. It's not of a scale that you can understand living in the state of California. Just, you just don't get it until you go out there. So it's worth sitting there. In my opinion, it's one of the best buildings of all time. Really worth going there. Um, so the Pantheon is exactly 150 feet in diameter. It's also exactly 150 feet tall. So if you had a ball or a sphere that was 150 feet in diameter, it would fit perfectly inside that space. And so that's what this diagram is showing us. We see that perfect circle inside this particular space. By the way, interesting side fact, this was the largest dome, largest spanning dome from when it was built in 113 AD until 1946. Almost 2,000 years, it was the largest dome built. Pretty cool. Uh, just some perspective on it. If you haven't actually been there before, um, to get an idea, it's not the most impressive building from the outside. It's the inside that counts in this particular context. Uh, and there we are. So look at how small these people are. In relation to this, pay attention to the tops of these columns. Let me flip back to that drawing for a second. That's only right here. So the people are little, itty bitty people. That's what I'm talking about. It's so big. And until you go there, you can't understand that. Uh, sometimes you're showing something where it looks like this during the day, and then it looks like this at night, or some kind of a contrast between one and the other. Typography or fonts. This is using text or typography to show what's happening in a particular portion of the building. It's a different diagrammatic technique, but it can be a very effective one. So right here, this is again an Alex Holgraf drawing. We see the graphic quality 
there, but he's emphasizing what's happening in a particular section of the building by the text. So classroom bridge, lobby, locker room, north entry, south entry. And so we see that just by big, nice text. Typography is absolutely essential here, picking the right font, having it look right, et cetera, but it's a great way of kind of showing what's happening in a particular drawing. Same thing here, what's the stage, what's the fly, et cetera. Not quite sure how that forms a building, but we'll go there. Uh, this was a library. I think it might have been a library in Washington. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, but it's the same concept here, where you've got what's happening in a given space diagrammed by the text that is in that particular space. We've got um, what's happening in the city. This is a much larger scale. It's kind of like a city planning scale. Uh, and then we've got these little plus signs that are scattered that are showing you s s important points relative to where this particular city is. <coughs> Diagrammatic techniques, movement. So we kind of already did arrows and flow lines with sometimes show movement, so this is kind of a crossover. But this is specific to how people move through space over time. So how does somebody um, move through the particular space? And we show that often by lots of little lines and lots of overlapping lines or lots of overlapping dots. So we have an understanding of how somebody's moving through the space, and then we might design accordingly. So this is something called cab spotting. I'm going to show you the live version because I think this works better. It's not really live, but the recorded version of it. Anybody heard of cab spotting before? Okay. Those of you that heard of it, don't say anything. right? But those of you that have never seen this before, Tell me when you know what this is. OK, that's good. I've got one, two, three, four. All right. You guys are pretty fast. I've done this where I've played it for like a minute and nobody's gotten it. Give it a few more times. A few of you are like, I have no idea. Manny, you were first. What is it? OK, you think it's more interest as a lobby. Anybody else? Yeah. I think it's the flow of traffic. Flow of traffic where? Define the city. What city? What city? Bingo. This is the city of San Francisco. And so as this plays over time, over the course of a day, we're seeing where the traffic is flowing. And by doing that, we're seeing where the streets are in San Francisco. So this isn't really a map of San Francisco. It's a diagram of San Francisco. It's a diagram of how, in this case, taxi cabs move through the city of San Francisco. The denser the lines are, the more frequently those, those cabs are in that particular area. So for example, what's going on down here? That's like probably the SFO. The airport. Everybody's going to the airport. What's going off up there? Bay Bridge. People going to Oakland. So you learn a lot about the city by looking at it in this context over the course of a day. Right? This big gap is Golden Gate Park. So we can recognize what's happening in the city just by how somebody's moving through the particular space. So using that same strategy, we could do flight patterns. We could do how people move through an airport. So this was one from my thesis. My thesis ended up being on SFO. At the time when I was doing it, Terminal 2 didn't, it was under uh, renovations. It had been closed. Uh, so there's a faint line of people connecting the two terminals. But it was just Terminal 1 and Terminal 3. And this is how people move through those terminals. I did it with a bunch of little dots. It was actually a hand drawing, uh, though I digitized it later. I always felt like this one looked like a guitar. Down at the bottom, but whatever. A uh, little bit closer view, um, security lines, and, and that sort of thing. A view diagram. You know, based on this bending, what could be seen, what couldn't be seen. Site diagram. We've got a river flowing through, and there's that particular swatch of a site. Uh, this was one that I did in thesis. So they asked us to diagram what we thought of our thesis. And so this is what I originally thought my thesis was going to be. No problem. I knew what I was going to do. Then I got into thesis, and it turned into that. That happens. 
Another example here, we're doing it with dotted lines. These are how people are moving through this particular space. Uh, and then in this context, they responded to that. And they carved out the space because of how people were moving through it. Uh, this is a series of examples of how, how, not in this case people, but things like the sun are moving around the building. This one here is kind of like the catch-all. And I think it would be a really interesting drawing. The sectional drawing is, it would be really interesting, except for the absolute corniness of the sun. Like, it is so screams clip art. Don't do that. Right? So let's make nice, attractive, and the raindrops are pretty bad too. But um, this was about the cycle and how the greenhouse would work and whatever. So I get what they were after, but there would just be a little bit cleaner way of doing it for such a beautiful drawing. Then we also have transformation as a strategy. So this is kind of like the what if. This is how it's always been done. What if I did it this way? This is how we've always done it. There's the skyscrapers. What if we laid them down? So it's a transformation. Typically, it's done like this. What if we did it like that? And again, it's, it's all about that one fundamental design idea. This is what is typical. We cut it, we pull it apart, and then we take one of them and we flip it over. So it's transformations. All right, so we're going to continue. Um, and so if, a lot of you have already read over the exercise 116 requirements, but we're going to start with some kind of a building. And I'm going to do a plan and I'm going to do a section. They do not have to be the same building, um, but it's a good place to kind of start to think about diagrammatic techniques. So first thing I'm going to do is uh, go online and I'm going to pull up some examples. Uh, and I think set from a sectional example, the Kimball Art Museum is a really good one because there's a lot to do with how the light uh, flows into one of these galleries. Uh, so you can see the gallery here. This is where the art is stored. There's no direct sunlight coming into the building. Uh, it comes through a little skylight in the center here and then gets reflected off and then a, off this, uh, this arcing barrel vault down into the space. So it's a very diffuse, even light. Uh, so it's a good one to try to diagram. So I'm going to use that one. I've gone ahead and I've looked for uh, the Kimball Art Museum section. This is in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, there's several different examples. Uh, of the, the section here. Any one of them is fine. I'm just going to use it as kind of a backdrop to then draw my own version of it. So in this case, that would be fine. Let me go ahead and see if I can open it in a new tab. I always love it when... Let me just right click and save image as. There we go. I'm going to put it in my downloads folder. That's fine. And so I'm going to go ahead in Illustrator and create a brand new document. I'll click on the Create New button here. There we go. I'm going to do a print version. I'm going to do a standard letter print. And I'm going to do it in the horizontal orientation. Go ahead and give it a name. And then I'll click on Create. There we go. So the first thing I want to do is I want to bring in that, uh, that section that I downloaded. So I'll go to File and then Place. It's a lot like InDesign where I could just drop something in by going to File and then Place. I'll go to my uh, Downloads folder. I'll take that Kimball Art Museum and we'll drop it in right like that. So in my case, it was small enough. If, if yours was not the right size, if you uh, select it uh, and then you grab one of the corners and hold down Shift, you can make it bigger. Like that. You get the idea. So in this scenario, I have this drawing. I'm going to draw over the top of this as I start to create my diagram. And so I'm going to do it using layers. Currently, this drawing is on layer 1. So I'll leave layer one here. I'm going to click on the new layer down here to create a new layer. And I'll start working on layer two. The advantage of working with these layers is that I can actually lock layer one so that I can't select it or, or do anything to it. I can also ultimately turn off that layer and have it go away. So the first thing that I need to do is I need to identify what are kind of the major components of this um, particular building. Uh, first of which would be the vault. Second of which would be the little diffuser. 
Third would probably be the floor. So when I simplify this, I'm going to start with the pen tool and I'm going to do some drawing. So we'll start here and I'm going to create the vault. You guys are all comfortable with the pen tool by now. So we'll go through, we'll create that vault. I'm going to go ahead and go to right there. I'm going to come back and edit that one in a second. All right, so there was my vault. I'm going to go back to the direct select tool so I can select that uh, anchor point, and then I'll pull this out so that I get my arc to come all the way down like that. So I can take this particular piece, and instead of having a white fill, I want a black fill. So I'll flip that so that it's black, and I'll also make my stroke to be nothing. So I just have that black fill. And if I were to turn off the background, we'd say that, okay, I'm starting to create the major components of this particular building. So there's the first side. The second side over here, I could trace it, or I could take this object here, and I could go to um, Object, and then Transform, and then Reflect. I'm going to reflect it vertically, but instead of saying OK, I'm going to click on Copy, so I get a copy of it, like that. Then I could move this one over to be right there. Uh, and I could transform this and draw the rest of it. It doesn't really matter because I'm not worried about the um, air conditioner unit, etc. Let's go ahead and just keep drawing. I need the floor. So we'll go ahead and go back to the pen tool. Remember, diagrams are about um, simple. So we'll come back to right there. And we'll fill this in. So now if I were to look at it without the background, we'd see, okay, I'm getting the major design ideas. I have a barrel vault. I have one wall on one side. It's open on the other side. The last piece is that little diffuser. So we'll go back and take a look at this little diffuser. I'm going to use my pen tool again. Sorry, I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. And I don't think they did a particularly good job of drawing this, this uh, diffuser. So I might tweak it a little bit. All right, something like that. I could then take this. Let me do one quick transformation I don't like. I think it needs to be a little bit more. No, a little longer. Yeah, right about like that. Uh, I could take this little diffuser here. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go up to Object, Transform, Reflect. I'm going to click on Copy so I get a copy of it. And we'll move it over so that it lines up right like that. If I wanted these two to be exactly the same, remember I can use the Align tools. I can go to View, uh, excuse me, Window, and then Align. And I could align those items to the top so that they come together like that. So now, if I were to turn off the background, press Control-0, I have a pretty good fundamental base of my particular diagram. I have the key components of the building. Now it's time to show how the light enters the space. And so I have some, some strategies for that, depending on how we want to show it. I'm going to start by creating another new layer. And I'm going to go ahead and call this layer Diagram 1. There it is. I'm going to make sure that that's selected. And then I'll go ahead with the pen tool, and I'm going to draw the light as kind of a beam of light. So the light would come in like this. It would hit that reflection. It would go off the reflection, so about like that. And then it would come down into the space like that. Now currently it's a fill, so it doesn't really look right. So let's switch it so that I have a stroke. There's my stroke. And now I can change the color to be more of a light color. So maybe something like that, kind of a nice dark yellow there. 
And now we're going to play around with the stroke to kind of show what this looks like. So could I end there and just have the light like that? Sure. But maybe I want to evolve this a little bit more. I could take this uh, line. I could show my stroke. Let's go into properties here under stroke. If I click on the word stroke, I get more detailed options here, one of which is to increase the size. So I could increase the size if I wanted like that. Remember, I can change the corner if I wanted it to be rounded or if I wanted it to be beveled. In this case, the beveled corner might be good because it looks kind of like it's reflecting. Now, I also have the ability to change and put arrowheads at the start or end of my line. So if I keep coming down here, I could add an arrowhead. So I could click on the end, and I have a variety of different arrows that I could choose from. So I could do something simple like that. That gives me an arrow. There are some rather corny ones. You know, that's probably not the right strategy here. Um, so you want to obviously think about what this would look like. Uh, and so I think for, for architectural purposes, generally a simple arrow, something like that, is a good strategy. Uh, there's a variety of them. This one's a little steeper. Um, that one's a little bit smaller. So depending on what you're trying to do, one of those should probably work. Some of the ones that are filled in end up being too heavy. Like they just seem too big. And so um, I would stay away from those. Uh, generally, something like this is a, is a pretty good strategy. Um, obviously, if you decrease the thickness of the line, the arrowhead itself gets smaller. If you want the arrowhead smaller or larger, you can change the scale percentage here. So I could say I want the, this to be at 200% and then the arrow would get bigger. So you could override what the natural scale would be if you wanted it to be. Let me go back to 100. Uh, they also have the ability to put tails on the other end. Again, something that you can very easily get to be corny, um, but I'm showing you that just so you're aware that those kinds of things happen. Generally, I don't worry about that and leave it at none. Uh, there are a few other circumstances where you might end up using like one of these where there's a little circle or a dot. Um, this is, again, too big of scale, but you could use that to point to something and, and identify that as a particular, kind of like a leader uh, would look. That one is a filled in dot, so you could use that um, for one of the diagrams where you're using text to, to point out this is this particular feature. So I'm going to switch this back. Uh, I'll go all the way to none for a second, like that. The other option, of course, with this would be to go in and actually draw your own arrow. So I could say, OK, well, let me go ahead and draw my own arrow, and I want it to look like that. It's a little off. Move it over. Maybe like that. So you could always draw your own arrow. So if you don't like one of the pre-done arrows, you could draw your own arrow. At that point, it's not a bad idea to go ahead and select them both and group them. You can do that by pressing Control-G or right-clicking and saying Group. The advantage there is that if you go to move it afterward, the two are going to stay together. So we have some other options when it comes to stroke, um, one of which is adding a dashed line. I'll come back and actually I'll save the dashed line for later. Um, remember, we also have our profiles. Should we want to um, have our lines start out thin and get thicker? This also works with the shape builder tool, or excuse me, the width tool. So we could manually adjust the width, just like we did with the letters, uh, as we start to create this. The other thing that we can do is we can bring up something called brushes. So let me go to view, and then I'm going to show, uh, excuse me, window, and then choose brushes. This brings up the brushes window here. And the brushes, uh, by default, there's not too many super attractive brushes. We could use a flat brush. This is like a calligraphy brush where you're kind of seeing it as if I did it. Um, and they have some other ones, some round ones, etc. But we can also go to these three little lines and choose to open a brush library. Uh, there are some arrows, but there's also a bunch of artistic. So we could come in here and we could say, let's go to chalk, charcoal, and pencil. We can see a bunch of kind of more artistic brushes. And with this selected, I could choose one of these brushes. And we're going to get a little bit more casual line, as if we had drawn it more by hand. Uh, and so that might be a strategy. So again, I select it. And I come down here and I pick one of these various brush styles. You can kind of scroll through and see which one looks right, depending on the look that you're going for. So that's definitely another strategy for applying um, a particular look. 
there are a lot of pre-done brushes that are really good. Um, and so you can pick from any one of those as you go forward. So the other strategy here would be to take this particular look and then do a bunch more, you know, where they're hitting at different angles. Oops. You know, where they're coming in like this and they're hitting higher. In that case, I might use the eyedropper tool to copy the settings from this one line. Uh, and then I could go in and I could apply my same brush. And so you can see a series of these lines kind of showing how they would all go together. Um, sometimes that's a good strategy. Maybe like that. Same thing, eyedropper copy it, and then we'll apply the same little brush stroke to it, etc. cetera. Uh, and so maybe that shows more of the reflections. And so there's a density there that kind of helps show it. Another strategy. So again, part of diagram is understanding how do you want to represent something. So maybe instead of the arrows, you'd rather do a gradient. We could do it with a gradient as well. I'll show you that one. Let me do a new layer. And we'll turn off those arrows. Oops. Looks like I made a mistake and didn't put those all on there. Diagram one layer, there we go. Let's turn them off. We'll work on layer four here. And so in this strategy, I'm going to be working with a fill. So let's start. Oops, there we go. Maybe about like that. And do a single click. I'll come across here. So essentially what I'm doing right now is I'm going through and creating a shape that I can then fill. So there's, there's the shape. If I flip my colors, now it's filled in with kind of that yellow color. But I want that to be a gradient. So to do that, I'm going to bring up the gradient tools. So let me go ahead and go into my window, and then I'll choose gradient. There it is. And with the gradient tools here, I'm going to choose to make a linear gradient. And let's see. Whoops. I don't want it on my stroke. I want it on my fill. So let's take my stroke and turn it transparent. Let's switch to my um, fill color, and then we'll go ahead and create the linear gradient. I want the black here to be the uh, yellow. So let me go ahead and pick a yellow. There we go. Uh, the other option would be to use the eyedropper to be able to pick the color if I still had the color up there, etc. So I have yellow. Um, the, this white point, instead of being white, I actually want it to be transparent. So I'm going to go down to a 0% opacity at that point. So I'm going from yellow to transparent as opposed to yellow to white. It's a subtle detail. But the other thing is it's currently coming from this corner and going to that corner. That's not the way I want it. So let's change it so that we're going down. So I'm going to change the angle to 90. And now you see that the, the light is starting here and it's getting more diffuse as it comes to the bottom. Now I'd rather have more of the solid yellow coming down in here. So I can actually adjust this slider over to have more yellow or I could adjust this slider here to pull more yellow that way, um, basically causing the, the transparency to occur in the last little bit as opposed to all of it. So as I pull that over like that, that may be the right strategy. I can then step back and take a look at, OK, so the light's coming in and it's diffusing off of those diffusers. So it's a very different strategy from this one, but they're both viable ways of showing how this works. Okay, so different strategies showing uh, essentially the same thing. So let me do another example. We're going to switch into plan view. Um, and I've, I've previously I've done the, uh, the Kimball Art Museum as a plan view, but I'm going to switch and I'm going to do a Rick Joy. Uh, I mentioned him a while back and I figured I'd bring him up again. Um, and so I'm going to do the Tubac house, uh, which is a plan right here. I'm going to use that plan uh, in just a second. So I'll right click and say save uh, image as. And we'll put it here in the same downloads folder. 
And just for reference, um, let me pull up the Tubok house just so you can kind of get a sense for what's happening. Um, you guys can, of course, look it up. It's in the desert. Right, and it's kind of carved into the slope. There you go for a little bit of a night view. This is the part that I'm really concerned with. It's how you enter the house. You kind of step down into this um, where it's, it's really pinching you down to a point, uh, and then the whole site opens up. Uh, it's a really nice way of entering the particular building. But anyway, you guys can scroll, scroll through these to get a little bit more context uh, of what the house would look like. If you just Google Tubok House, you'll, you'll find it. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to Illustrator. I'm going to create a new document. So I'll go to File and then New. We're going to do the same thing. Letter, Landscape Orientation. And I'll go ahead and click on Create. There it is. Uh, first thing I'll do is I'll go to File and then Place. And I'll bring in that plan view. There it is. I might need to make it a little bit larger. Not like that. Did that stay in proportion? Got to make sure I hold down Shift as I change the proportions there. So now in this context, it might be useful instead of actually drawing over everything, which I could of course do, it might be useful to use this as the, the background, but to change the opacity of this particular file. So I might take this and bring up my transparency window. So let me go into window and then transparency. And I might change the opacity so that it's a little bit more faded long term. So I don't get as much detail. I just have a little bit of background and then I can emphasize certain pieces. So it's just a different strategy. So there it is. Remember, of course, this is a black and white image. I could switch my blending mode to multiply to make the white transparent, which might be useful long term depending on what you're underlaying behind it. So in this context, I'm going to go ahead and create a new layer. So this would be my first diagram. Oops. All right, I'll make that the active layer. I will lock layer one. Uh, and so this one is going to be about how people travel. So they come into this space, they walk down the stairs to this little pinch point, and then they move out from there. So I have to imagine that I'm at this particular house. And I want to think about how somebody moves. So I'll start with my line. And we'll start here and we'll come in. And we'll come down the stairs. And then what happens at this point? Well, some people, you know, they were bringing their groceries home. So they come over here and they go into the kitchen. Like that. Now somebody else comes home. And they come down the stairs. And they're, they're a guest, so they're so overwhelmed that they have to come out here and they have to look at the view for a while. And then they come around and they wait for somebody back over in here, for example. So I'm just kind of imagining what it would be like to enter this particular building. So I'm blocking parts of it because my fill color is white. Let me make sure that goes to transparent so I can just see those particular uh, lines. So then I keep going. Same strategy here where we keep going with my pencil or excuse me, my pen tool, and we again come down there, and this person is going to walk through there and meet up with that person. And then we keep going, oops, and we keep going, somebody else is going to come in here, and this person also has some groceries, so he'll, they'll come in there. And so part of the strategy here is that you've got a density of lines of how all these start to overlap and intersect. And kind of like the cab spotting exercise, at some point you start to see some similarities. This person really had to go to the bathroom. Anyway, you get the idea, right? Uh, you start to see, OK, well, wait a minute. The density is happening right here, and then they spread out. So there's a fan and a funnel. And so this is telling us about how people move through this particular space. So it may be beneficial to show this as a series of lines. But you might want to take it from a series of lines and maybe make them dashed lines so they weren't quite so solid. So first off, I could take all of these lines. And I could change the color 
Uh, and so maybe in this context, maybe I want the color to be more of a red color. So I can see them all as red lines. But I could also take all of those lines and come back to the stroke options. So I'll click on the word stroke here. And this is where I can transform this into a dashed line. So if I check the box for dashed lines, I get the ability to choose the length of the dash and the length of the gap. So at this particular point, by default, it comes in at 12 point. And so if I were to deselect, we see that we have kind of long lines with long gaps. So I could change that and thereby changing the density, I could say, you know what, I want a two point gap or a two point dash with a two point gap. And suddenly those lines would be a lot tighter from a look. So it's a different look. You could also say that I want the lines to be a little bit longer, so maybe they're a four point with a two point gap. In that scenario, each of the little lines is a little bit longer. So you can kind of sort out what looks best for you. You could also take it all the way down to maybe a one point dash and a one point gap. In this scenario, they're almost little tiny squares that go through. But what if, what if you want to customize this a little bit more? What if instead of having those dots, you would like to say have footprints? Well, we can do that. So the first thing I need to do is I need to draw my feet, my footprints. So I'm not going to draw them in bare feet. I'll draw shoes. So let me come over here. And I will draw a pair of shoes, I hope. Let me flip it so that it has a fill color. Let me put a little heel on this shoe to try to make it obvious that it's a shoe. Sorry, I have to zoom in a little bit. Might need to make a few modifications. That corner, I accidentally didn't make it a smooth corner. There we go. Uh, let me transform and reflect this one. I just think it looks better that way. Maybe about like that. It's kind of an ugly shoe, really. But anyway, you, get the, you guys get the idea here. I group those. I'm going to splay it out just a little bit. I'll take this shoe. I'm going to copy it. Sorry, let me select it, edit, copy, edit, paste. I'm going to transform that one. I'll go to object, transform. I'm going to reflect it. No, I'm going to reflect it again. We're going to do horizontal. And I'll separate that out by the other side of the footprint. So I've got those two things set up. Now, once I have those two pieces set up, if I select them, like that, and then I drag them over to the brushes. So I have to make sure the brushes window is showing, which it is. So I'd go to window and then brushes to make sure it's showing. If I select them and then drag them over to the brushes window, you're going to see that it kind of highlights the window in blue. And then I can drop my two shoes into the brushes window. That brings up the new brush dialog box. And I have a couple different options. I can create a scatter brush, an art brush, or a pattern brush. We're going to be creating a scatter brush here. I'll go ahead and say OK. And we'll call this um, footprints. Like that. Now, if we go down here, we've got size. Well, my shoe size isn't going to change, so we should have a fixed shoe size. My spacing should also be fixed, because really my, my stride isn't going to change that much. My scatter, that can be fixed. My rotation, however, instead of being fixed, I'm going to, no, it's going to stay fixed but it needs to be relative to, not the page, but it needs to be relative to the path that it's on. So I want to stay horizontal, but I want to follow the path, depending on where the path goes. Um, colorization, this is if I wanted to change the color. We could do a tints color, color, uh, colorization, that's fine. And I'll go ahead and say, OK, all of these options are available to change after the fact. So if you find you screwed it up, you can go back and change them. I'll go ahead and say, OK. And you see that now I have two little footprints here. 
I can then come over to one of my lines, say that line. I can click on the footprints, and now that line has been replaced with a series of footprints. A uh, couple things. One, uh, the footprints are going the wrong direction, which we're going to have to adjust. And two, they're much too big. So first thing, we're going to change that stroke size. So I'll say maybe 0.1. Oh, too small. There we go. Maybe that's about right, etc. Now I need to uh, flip the direction of this path, and I'm forgetting how I do that. Reverse path direction. So there we go. Object, path, reverse path direction. There it is. Now the feet are going the right direction. So I can use those feet for all of these. So I can once again use the footprints. We're going to change the size to 0.25. And then I'm going to take all of them except for that one. And I'm going to reverse the path direction. So I'm going to go to object, path, and then reverse path direction. There we go. They're all going in the right direction. Uh, and you can see that over time, certain paths would be emphasized as I drew more and more of them. So it's just another strategy. I don't have to do this with footprints. I could do it with dog prints. I could do it with boxes or circles or anything else that I want. The concept is still there. OK? Um, there are other options that I could explore if I wanted to. Um, for example, if I wanted to put uh, a series of birds or bats or something, I guess it's Halloween, so we should do a bat. Let me just do this really quick. Um, not necessarily relevant to what we're doing right here, but I like to introduce this as part of the, the um, brushes. I'm going to do this as a bit of a cartoonish bat because I don't want to spend all day doing this. Okay, so I have this little bat like that. Um, with all of that selected, I can then create the brush again. It's going to be a scatter brush. And so with this scatter brush, this time I'm going to change my size to be random, and I can choose to be within a certain percentage. So I, let's say this is um, 80 and 120. My spacing, I can choose to be random. Same thing, where I could edit between 80 and 120. My scatter can be random again. So we'll just say from there to there. Uh, and my rotation, let's do that random, like that. Um, same colorization, and we'll go ahead and say OK. So now in this scenario, if I drew a line like that, and I applied this bat brush to it, you'd see that the bats are going to be scattered at a random interval, and they're going to rotate a certain amount. So some of these are rotated one way, some are done the other way. So it's a random way of kind of establishing some things in the sky. It's a little bit different way of doing it, but I like to introduce that as part of the brushes concept, should you want to. OK, in terms of brushes, um, another strategy, and you guys have seen this one before. Um, sometimes you want, let's say that I create some little curls. Kind of like a set of vines. Oops. Okay, 
So let's say that I did that. I could take this line, and again, I can drag it over here, but this time I'm going to do an art brush. And what an art brush does is it takes your pattern and then stretches it along the line. So I go ahead and say, okay, I have the art brush, it tells me the direction. We'll do it tints. Um, the same thing here, all of that, the defaults are fine. I'll go ahead and say, okay. And now if I were to draw a line that was curving, say like that, and I took this line and I applied that to it, this shape would curve along that line. In this particular example, it might not be the most attractive, but you guys get the idea. So that's just, that's an art brush instead of a scatter brush. Uh, and so I wanted to make sure that I showed you that. Okay, so let me go ahead and let me turn all of those off and I'm going to create another drawing here. And so let's say that I wanted to kind of color code this particular drawing or highlight some regions of this drawing. Uh, this is going to involve something called a live paint. So what I need to do to create the live paint is I first need some lines to, to kind of define what I want to paint in. This will be relevant for your Charlie Harper potentially too. Uh, and so I'll start by creating some of the main lines uh, in this particular drawing. Now the good news about this is I don't need to see these lines uh, long term. I can just go ahead and start drawing them. And I don't have to be super precise. They can overlap. In fact, it's even better if they overlap. So I can kind of just trace over these. Oops, didn't mean to, I just wanted a straight line there. Sorry, bear with me. Almost there. Okay, so in this scenario, I've got a bunch of lines that I used my background to kind of identify. So there's a bunch of lines. Uh, I might actually end up needing a few more. I need one here at the bottom of the stairs. And I might change and take this one so that it goes across the stairs like that. So I didn't spend a lot of time being perfectly careful with these lines. But let's say that I wanted to fill in some of these regions. So I wanted to be able to say, okay, this is the pool, this is the kitchen, this is some other space, this is the outdoor space, or whatever. Uh, I can do that using something called the Live Paint tool. Now, when I use the Live Paint tool, uh, it will destroy any kind of special lines. So if I had, say, if this had a special um, uh, brush applied to it, when I do the Live Paint, it's going to get rid of the brushes. So, um, it's always a good strategy to make a copy of your layer before you do the live paint. So I'll take layer three, I'll click the little fly out next to it, I'll say duplicate layer three, and I will then rename layer three to be live paint. And if you're going to do multiples, sometimes you number them. Live paint one. I'll turn everything off except for live paint one. I will select all the objects, so control A or drag a box around all of them. <coughs> Sorry. Then I'm going to go up to uh, Object, I'm going to come down to Live Paint, and then Make. So Object, Live Paint, and then Make. And when I do that, it's going to say something like this. Complex visual appearance attributes such as brushes um, will be converted and lost. That's fine. Go ahead and say OK. And it then creates the Live Paint group. Now when I look at that, if you look at the, um, the bounding box here, I have little stars in the corner of my group. So it's a different sign of setup here. I can then come over to the Live Paint tool, which they probably hid on me. Why 
Why am I not seeing it? It used to be under the Shape Builder tool. Hmm, where did they hide it? Let me just select the object. Maybe it does it by default. Let me go into properties. Huh. You gotta love it when stuff changes and then I get stumped, right? <laughs> Thank you. Live paint bucket. There we go. Can I drag it in here? Wow. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm shocked that it's not there by default. Um, okay. So I was able to add it by clicking these three little dots and then choosing Live Paint Bucket and dropping it over here. Uh, I, I apologize for that and not knowing that. But anyway, with the Live Paint Bucket tool selected, I can then come over, and if I did it correctly, it will kind of highlight the various regions such that I could fill in those regions. And so I could say, okay, let me change my fill color to be pink, and then I could say, okay, I want, oh, come on. There we go. And I want that region to be pink. And then I want that region to be green. So you get the idea where I could go through and I could color code specific uh, pieces. Remember what I said about too many colors? Um, so um, just, just be aware that this is pretty easy to go through. Now one of the things I typically do when I do a live paint is I go through and I paint all of the regions and they may not be in their final colors. I just pick some colors to go ahead and um, paint them with. And then I'll change them after the fact. So let's get down here to a red. And there we go. So I painted all of those particular colors. When I'm done and I want to work with that, I'm going to come over to the properties window and there's a button for expand. And when I click on expand, it will break these apart into individual groups that I can then select with the direct select tool. So I can click on these individual groups. I could select these colors. I could move them up onto their own layer, which would leave me just the colored regions, not the lines themselves. I could take all of these colored regions and I could change their opacity. So I could go back to properties. I could change their opacity to be like, let's say 30%, so they just had a little bit of color to them. I could come back and I could turn on my original uh, layer, and you can start to see where that would end up being the color code strategy. Okay, so live paint is something that's really good for filling in shapes. Um, one of the problems with live paint is when you have a shape that doesn't quite connect. So if I had something like this, So I have this, I select them, I say object, live paint, make, and then I go to my live paint tool and I go to paint and it's going to say, wait a minute, I can't do that because these two overlap, there's a gap, and so the paint would leak out through that gap. So in that scenario, I actually need one more line, so I would need a line that goes across like that, and at that point, I may be able to paint it, there you go. So I, I added a line to that to do it. If you, back up for a second, if you drew another line that was completely separate that crossed them like that, 
and you went back to the live paint, even if you selected them all and you went to live paint, it probably still wouldn't let you do it because you actually need to merge that new object into the live paint group. You can do that by going to object, live paint, and then merge. It adds the, that new object entirely into the live paint group, which you can then paint with your particular color. Okay, so we went through brushes, we went through live paints, a um, bunch of different gradients, we went through a bunch of different strategies today. It doesn't mean that you have to do all of those strategies, but I'm gonna ask you to diagram two buildings one is in section, one is in plan. You take your pick. You can choose how much of the original building you want to show. So in this case, the color coding, I probably would show the original building behind. In the case of my Kimball Art Museum, something like this is probably a little bit cleaner as a diagram than one where it was showing the background information like this. Even if I took that background information and I changed the opacity of it, it still doesn't really add too much. So in that scenario, I think it would be better to just keep that one off and keep the clean drawing itself. So today will be our last day for now in Illustrator. We're gonna move on to AutoCAD next class and then we'll come back to Illustrator. So it doesn't mean that we're done with Illustrator, but I wanna work on some other stuff first and then we'll come back to Illustrator, work some more with the, the collaging techniques and the live paints.